Welcome everyone, my name is Neha and I'm presenting this webinar on behalf of Funds for NGOs, one of the leading fundraising platforms for NGOs around the world. Today's topic is how to plan and prepare the budget for a US aid project proposal. This webinar will run for about 45 minutes and at the end, We'll also have a Q&A session of 15 minutes. To post your questions, we request you all to use the chat option on your screen and our experts here will be glad to answer your queries. The objective of today's webinar is to provide an insight on a detailed description of a general USAID proposal budget format, how to begin working on it, what criteria to follow and learn to determine costing under different categories with examples. Now I will explain the course outline briefly. In the beginning, I will talk about budget and its importance for NGOs. Then I will give an introduction on USAID and the basics of writing the proposal, followed by the various types of solicitations by the USAID. Then I will discuss what to look for in a solicitation along with the typical USAID budget format. And lastly, I will discuss the key points you should remember while writing the proposal for USAID. So let's start today's session. But first of all, I would like to inform you that Funds for NGOs is offering a special discount for its premium membership you may sign up by visiting the registration link available in the chat box. Now, let's understand budget in simple terms. A budget is a document where you specify how much money you're going to spend, especially if your organization has received grants. In some cases, as in businesses, budgets can also include the money that the organization is going to generate or income. The latter is important for all NGOs now because managing an organization, including an NGO, does not mean just a spending. We also need to look at how costs can be covered and money can be saved for other activities. In another sense, budget is all about planning your expenses and saving your costs. Many NGOs tend to plan out a budget only when they need to develop a project proposal for a donor agency. Besides, they only think of the short-term project needs, not about the long-term sustainability of the organization. Developing and managing budgets can be a challenging task for NGOs. Whenever they need to plan a project, write a proposal, and implement an activity. Efficient financial management is essential for the growth of any organization. Besides, if you have a well-managed and transparent financial system, it, is, it enables donor agencies to gain confidence in your NGO and offer support to it. However, setting up an efficient financial system requires a sound understanding of financial practices and principles. With a budget, NGOs can smoothly manage organizational expenses and income, plan project activities, fulfill donor expectations, and also work towards long-term sustainability of the organization. There are some myths about budgets. First, let's discuss them and simultaneously, I will try to clarify each myth. Number one, budgets cannot be changed. Well, budgets can be modified to some extent. You can diversify your resources and cut down costs. Of course, take prior permission from your donor agency for this. Number two, budgets can be developed overnight. Often in our effort to meet proposal deadlines, we develop budgets overnight. And this ends up in poor planning and even rejection of proposals. 
always take time to build your budget. Your NGO should live with a budget always. Number three, budgets do not have a basis. Well, budgets should be developed on a certain base. They cannot be developed without any basis. In most cases, the basis should be the previous year's income and expenditure. If applying for a project, look out for the expenses of the project's previous year. Mm, donor funding limitation to be also considered. Number four, budget can be developed by a single person. Well, budget work is a joint exercise. It is a teamwork. Involving the entire team is important to produce an effective budget. Number five, budgets have same formats. All budgets do not have same formats. Different budgets are developed for different purposes. For example, if you are writing a proposal, it is a different budget format. And if you are managing an organization, you will have a different budget format. Similarly, different donor agencies have different budget formats. Now, moving on to the main topic. Let's discuss the USAID process and what all are required while writing its proposals. But before we move further, I would like to shed a light upon USAID's major work area and its funding process. So USAID releases a wide range of federal grant opportunities for the developing nations with the aim of furthering its objectives of saving lives, reducing poverty, strengthening democratic governance and progress by means of humanitarian assistance and international development efforts. USAID works in over 100 countries in the areas of promoting global health, supporting global stability, providing humanitarian assistance, catalyzing innovation and partnerships, and empowering women and girls. Well, you must know that the USAID grant awards are given in a highly competitive manner, and understanding the eligibility and capacity of your organization must be the first step towards preparing yourself in pursuit of a USAID funding opportunity. You may choose to apply for any of the several types of funding that USAID offers. You may respond to a request for a proposal or RFP, apply for the New Partnerships Initiative or NPI, or submit a proposal for various theme or project-based grant and partnership opportunities, or even submit an unsolicited proposal to the USAID. Now, dear participants, a reminder for you all that during this webinar, Funds for NGOs is offering a special discount for its premium membership. To sign up for this, you may visit the registration link available in the chat box. Now, coming back to the topic, there is this one question that might have crossed your mind once, that what does budgeting process include? If we talk in general, the budgeting process involves a detailed planning of resources as per the programmatic activities, is estimating the costs for each of the activities and aspects, and mapping the various sources. If you integrate the organizational and programmatic aspects within the project planning and the budgeting process, it contributes towards more accountable and more closer to accurate estimation of resources and costs. Also, involving the wider organizational team to get their inputs around the process is important for this process. Preparing a budget for a USAID proposal will need extra care and compliance with the RFA or RFP. So make sure you do your research properly before preparing a proposal application and the budget for the same. For those of you just joining us, I welcome you all to the live webinar organized by Funds for NGOs 
one of the leading fundraising websites for NGOs around the world. And today's topic is how to plan and prepare the budget for a US aid project proposal. My name is Neha. Now, moving on to the next slide. Here we'll discuss the basics of the proposal process and various types of solicitations by the USAID. USAID encourages a large number of applications and competition to ensure high quality proposals and solutions. To this end, USAID issues solicitations and asks the organizations to respond to them. Well, before applying for any opportunity, you must know that there are various types of solicitations offered by the USAID to assess your organizational capacities, select potential partners, and get detailed understanding of the planned work. Therefore, it is important to read the solicitation thoroughly, conduct deep research, and also get in touch with the previous USAID partners in the region and domain to understand the best practices, building on past successes, and have samples to help you in your application process. Now let's discuss the calls and notifications released by the USAID. Number one, request for information, or RFI. A call for organizations to share technical or other requested information before issuing a formal solicitation. Number two, pre-solicitation notice. A noti notification that the agency will be issuing a solicitation. Number three, sources sought notice. A notice to determine the number of organizations interested in a possible funding opportunity, their level of experience and qualifications, and the suitability of an activity for a particular type of small business set aside. Number four, draft notice of funding opportunity or NOFO. A draft of the NOFO released before the formal solicitation is announced. Its purpose is to receive feedback and input. Number five, draft scope of work. A draft of the planned scope of work that enables organizations to provide feedback and to get a better understanding of a planned activity. The actual funding opportunity solicitations involve the following steps and aspects. Once funding is available and USAID is interested in offering funding to organizations in various domains, the USAID issues a solicitation. There are different types of solicitations. Let's discuss them one by one. Number one. Request for Proposal, or RFP. It is an official call for proposals with complete details about the projects and areas to be funded, evaluation criteria, and all necessary information related to the RFP. Number two, Notice of Funding Opportunity, or NOFO, as we discussed earlier. It is an official solicitation for assistance awards, also called the Grants and Cooperative Agreements. Number three, Annual Program Statement, or APS, a call to action released by USAID on grants.gov usually once a year that outlines the need for a specific kind of program and encourages the submission of a wide range of concept papers. Number four, Broad Agency Announcement, or BAA. This entails a competitive and collaborative research and development process used to seek innovative solutions to development challenges from public, private, for-profit, and non-profit partners. Now, let's discuss the initial step. First things first, you must register on the USAID grant portal as an individual or as an organization. 
it is a very simple and quick process and allows access to all available opportunities by USAID, both posted and forecasted. Here is a screenshot of how the page looks. You will need to sign in and create an account on the portal to be able to view and access the grants opportunities here. Once logged in, you can select the grants opportunities on the page named Search Grants, where you can filter the opportunities on the basis of parameters like the status of the opportunity, posted, forecasted, closed or archived, or of eligibility, category, or agency. Now, moving on to the most important aspect, and that is what to look for in a solicitation. Well, the foremost thing is to go through the solicitation in depth and detail and make notes of the important points. Some points to be understood well in detail would be the scope of work, evaluation criteria, and eligibility criteria, aspects that will be funded to have clarity about your budgeting and scope for co-funding too, if needed. Upon reading the solicitation requirement carefully, determine the size and scope of budget for the same, and make sure you understand the application requirements. Secondly, Review and understand the evaluation criteria and their order of importance as listed in the solicitation. Some of the criteria may include technical expertise, staffing, experience and capabilities, and past projects and successes. Only apply if you are eligible for the RFA or RFP. <clears throat> Now, while reviewing the solicitation, if any aspect is not clear, ask your questions well in time, in writing and in a concise and clear manner. The next is to clearly demonstrate your competencies and USPs in the domain and geography. Yes, make sure your applications stand out from those of the competitors. For this, demonstrating your strengths as an organization that is expert in the domain and well-equipped in terms of programmatic, financial, and overall transparency, accountability, and responsibility. Besides these, you should remember some other obvious things that are Number one, being aware of deadlines and timelines. Make sure you keep track of time and submit your proposals or applications well in time, if possible, ahead of the deadlines. Number two, following solicitation or application instructions. Each solicitation includes specific requirements and instructions for preparing your response. Prepare a checklist and keep striking them off as you complete the steps. Number three, understanding the funder. It is important to demonstrate that your organization clearly understands the USAID's operations, goals, strategies, and priorities. Review the relevant country development cooperation strategies understand the work in your country and domain, and keep up to date with its latest projects and successes. Now let's move further to discuss the overview of budgeting for USAID funding. The budgeting part of a proposal for USAID might seem a daunting task at first. It can be because of the seemingly complex formats, strict criterion, and the level of detail needed. So here are some important points to note before we get into the details of the budgeting process. First, your organization's mission and capabilities must be aligned with USAID's proposed program. And you must go through the eligibility criteria in detail 
based on the terms of the US aid solicitation. Number two, read the solicitation completely and very closely. Make sure you understand the program description, expected goals, results and objectives, the kind of work and activities that will be or will not be supported, cost implications, basic budget elements, cost categories, indirect costs, cost sharing aspects, and the application formats. Number three, make sure that you apply your application and budget strictly in line with the requirement and the stated amount of the US aid solicitation. This amount or range will be visible to you once you log in the grants.gov portal and click on a particular opportunity. Now, a US aid assistance implies a binding contract. Therefore, your organization will be financially and programmatically responsible for complying with the terms of the US Aid Assistance Award, and your organization will be accountable for achieving US Aid's desired results in line with your organization's own objectives if awarded. So, here are the key considerations you should undertake while discussing the budgeting for US Aid. Number one, it is very crucial to understand that the programmatic aspects of any project or program are directly linked with the budgetary items or cost implications. Therefore, when you are working on your proposal or application and outlining your programmatic approach, you need to ask yourself certain basic cost-related questions, for example, which activities would the program need? What would be the frequency? Would the program staff need to travel? If yes, will it be national or international travel? What capital costs might the program incur? Example, what might be the cost of the equipment or supplies needed to implement the program? What would be the what would be the periodic reporting requirements? Would it need additional resources? What might be some of the additional costs, like branding or marketing costs, etc.? Now, all of these questions are important for you to ask yourself as you determine your program's cost. It may be worthwhile also to chalk out a complete list of resources that the program might need, including financial, human, technical resources, knowledge expertise, and so on. Mapping out these inputs to run the program activities will help in more closely determining the various cost heads. For example, a primary education project in the rural areas might need the following resources. Number one, financial resources. Capital one time, like building, playground, or renovation expense if using existing building. Operational or recurring program costs like curriculum, books, enrollment related expenses, etc. Number two, human resources. Teachers, program coordinators, field workers, data collectors, M&E, and so on. Number three, technical resources. Subject matter experts, SME, to develop curricula, academic linkages, knowledge networks, and so on. Now, it is critical that these get derived from the programmatic planning. A tentative process to arrive at these would like program goals, objectives, activities, inputs needed, inputs or resource categories, and last, costing estimation. Now, taking the example of primary education program in rural areas, 
here is the information that the estimation process must provide you with program goals which might be high achievement and personal development for children to reach their maximum potential and then objectives which might include to increase enrollment and reduce dropout rate from 50% to 0% in 5 years number 2 to enhance academic achievements and results for 500 children in 5 schools and you may add one more objective if you want to now moving on to activities examples of activities might be organizing awareness drives in the villages increasing focus on activity based learning for primary school children or working with the local stakeholders and opinion influencers to work on awareness and like that now inputs needed might be teachers trainers field workers data collectors school building as capital expense curriculum etc technical or knowledge experts like subject matter experts knowledge network etc now in input resources categories try to categorize the listed inputs under categories of resources and put these in a structure format like human resources financial resources technical resources knowledge resources and so on and the last costing estimation as per the local cost estimates for each of the described category try to create separate rows and columns to add costs once we have these mapped out we can start cost estimation for each of them for example human resources we need to add remuneration any development or training costs travel costs not to forget the annual raise or appraisals and other related costs similarly we need to estimate the costs of the building curriculum development costs related to the technical expertise lastly we also need to estimate other operational costs like electricity internet communication costs field travel costs and any contingencies now it is critical that we conduct this budgeting and allocation of resources as per the agreed results and hence we start from the goal and objectives levels as we have discussed earlier in the last example now once you have these estimations in place you must also look at and specify the sources of funds or resources you must be getting funding from other partners or funding agencies it is important to mention that too financial resource amounts in this column should specify if these amounts are from regular or other sources that is trust fund or other funding agencies or donors it may be noted when these amounts are in kind do not need to be quantified in financial terms we still advise mapping the in kind resources too in order to make sure you do not miss adding any related costs for example suppose that you intend to run the program through the existing school structure rather than establishing a new system or a new school in parallel for this you plan to use the current school system teachers and the existing school buildings in the villages this must be captured even in that case specifying the source of the input example local village administration or school name and ensuring that related costs are estimated and added the school building might need any refurbishments 
additional resources like computers, etc. Please note that this is an example and the costing will depend on the exact project budget format requirements. Next, we will talk about the typical USAID budget and the important points to remember before submitting your budget. Now, every USAID solicitation would need you to complete a budget in certain predefined formats, which will include a standard form format, an additional budget with more detail, and if needed, additional formats for subcontracting or sub-awarding. Make sure that you strictly follow the exact budget template given with the solicitation. The budget-related information is usually required to be submitted in three formats. Number one, summary budget. Number two, the detailed budget. And the last one, budget narrative. We will advise that before you start working on the actual proposal and budget format, you can start with a rough budget template. Start filling a rough budget template with the inputs or resources that you feel will be required to carry out the program activities. For making this rough budget, you may use your organization's standard budget format. This rough budget can then be translated to the template required in the solicitation. If you do not have a standard budget format, you may use this one or prepare one using these categories. You may use Excel file format for ease of calculation and inserting formulas. Now, important points to note. You will need to use only USAID budget formats strictly for the purpose of the entire cost application that accompanies your proposal application. I repeat, you will need to use only USAID budget formats strictly. Now, you will need to present your costs in the three following ways. First, you will need to prepare a summary budget which presents a breakdown of all the costs by the major line item categories. Second, you need to further break down the major line item categories into their subcategories to give further details of the costs in the form of a more detailed budget. And lastly, you will need to prepare a detailed budget narrative document that provides the reasoning to each proposed cost with the degree of detail needed, explaining how the spending will be done, also giving a glimpse of how the spending would be linked with the overall objectives and programmatic goals. Secondly, the budget must be in line with the technical narrative. Also remember that all the three budget formats, summary, detailed, and narrative, should match with each other. Number three, your cost estimate should be based on accurate costs, if possible, or estimations, even if indicative estimates. Competitive and in total sync with the project activities Number four, make sure that you include the teams during the proposal and budget-related discussions so that you capture their inputs. Apart from the program team, you must include your HR, procurement, and finance department too. Number five, in the summary budget, provide accurate sums under each category following the format as per the opportunity documents. Make sure you include any cost shares if applicable. 
cost share means any contributions or resources towards your program that you will cover from other sources. This would mean these will be excluding the budget you are proposing to USAID. This would be given clearly in the USAID solicitation whether such cost share contributions are needed and allowed or not. Cost share can include the in-kind donations or resource sharing, like the school building, donated equipment, volunteer time, and other such resources. Remember that you will be responsible to meet such commitments as per your budget and your proposal as a condition of your USAID funding, if granted. Number six. The detailed budget is where you must describe each of the major cost elements, their subcategories and descriptions. Remember that the subcategories must be consistent with the summary budget heads and the amounts must match. Describe each subcategory with sufficient detail. Try to break down each cost into these categories unit cost, number of units, and type of unit to calculate the overall cost. Number seven, in the detailed budget and budget narrative, make sure you provide enough information to the USAID about each cost head and justify the relevance of the activity for the program. For example, in the corresponding budget narrative, you can explain why the given travel is necessary and relevant. You must give details of how frequent the travel will be, whether it will be local or international travel, who will be expected to travel, purpose of each person to travel, number of travel days, and so on. Remember to be as detailed as possible. Number eight, the budget narrative must provide detailed explanation of your costing and of the assumptions made to derive the costing under the various categories. Now, here are some examples of how to determine costing under each heading or category. Number one, personnel. Identify staffing requirements by each position title and brief description of duties. List the annual or monthly salary for each position, percentage of time devoted to the project. Number two, fringe benefits. These are any employment benefits that staff paid from the proposed project will receive. These may include any benefits like staff health insurance, educational benefits, etc. Benefits should be calculated based on the standard employment benefits offered by the organization or country where they will work and should follow the minimum requirements mandated by law. State benefit costs separately from salary costs and explain how you have calculated the benefits for each stated employee. Number three, travel. Include here any travel that the staff may require to undertake as per the program requirements, make sure you include all kinds of travel that might be international, in-country, local, etc. You must include here the costs of transport, boating, lodging costs, and the per diem rates for each staff. Per diem must be in line with the country rates and as per USAID. And now number four, equipment. Include the cost of any equipment needed for
for the program or project with justification for the purchase or rental. Make sure you also account for depreciation in the subsequent years. As per the value, usually durable equipment is defined as any item valued at 5,000 US dollar or more and an expected life of two years or more. Expendable equipment or supplies are items valued at less than 5,000 US dollar and with an expected life of two years or less. Please read the solicitation requirements and USAID specifications regarding this carefully. Number five, supplies. The specifications and cost of each type of supply proposed must be included in this section. Number six, contractual. Here, you must include any subgranting or subcontracting work as and if needed. Include a detailed breakdown of the services you will be subgranting or subcontracting in line with the solicitation rules. You may also consider any consultancy fee if you are going to hire consultants for uh, the project at any step. And the last one, other direct costs. These will vary depending on the nature of the project and each cost should be justified in the budget narrative. So with this, I would like to conclude today's webinar. The USAID proposal process might seem daunting to many. Therefore, through today's session, we tried to simplify the process by helping you with some guidelines around preparing a budget format for your USAID proposal by offering a sample budget, tips and best practices. And we hope that you have made the most use of this session. That's all for today's webinar. Lastly, a gentle reminder for all our participants that we are offering a special discount for premium membership for a limited time only. To sign up for this, please visit the registration link available in the chat box. Also, we are happy to announce that we have launched our Funds for NGOs premium mobile app. Now you may download and log into your premium membership account from your iPhones and Android mobile phones instantly. This premium app will help NGOs, development practitioners and fundraisers in finding new donors, receiving regular grant updates, developing new skills for resource mobilization and more. So what are you waiting for? Download Funds for NGOs premium mobile app now. Dear participants, as we have discussed at the beginning of the webinar, we will have a 15 minutes Q&A session at the end. So I request you all to get ready with your questions. Our team of experts will try to clear your doubts as much as possible. And in the meantime, I will try to read out the frequently asked questions and the Q&As that will benefit the majority of the participants. So for everyone's awareness, we are seeing the questions coming in and our experts are ready to answer each of the questions. Now, in few minutes, I will start reading the Q&As for you all. The first question is, Hi, thank you for enlightening us with such informational webinar on USAID budget. Now, I'm keen to know the process that USAID follows while soliciting proposals. 
Is it possible for you to organize another webinar describing the USAID solicitation process? Thank you for your kind words. We appreciate that you liked our webinar. And it's good to know that you want us to organize another webinar on the USAID solicitation process. Unfortunately, we cannot immediately promise you that. But to better assist you, we can provide you with the premium guide on things to know when applying for USAID grants, which will answer all your questions. We insist you to take our premium membership and take advantage of this guide. This is one of the most downloaded premium guides by our users. Now, moving on to another question. Does USAID support small and grassroots organizations? If yes, then what are the modes of providing assistance to these organizations? Certainly, yes, USAID does support small and grassroots organizations with its Small Project Assistance Program, SPA, they welcome individuals and organizations with new and innovative ideas to address global development challenges and how we can do development differently. You will be surprised to know that USAID has field offices in several developing countries for providing technical and financial aid for tackling the development issues globally. You may read our free article on how does USAID support NGOs to access more information on this topic. The link for that is available in the chat box. Moving ahead to the next question, what are the benefits of having a properly developed budget in your proposal? Hello friend, thank you for being a part of this webinar. Coming to your question, Budget will give you an overview of what you have used, what you need to use, and how much more is left. So it will give you an understanding of how your project is progressing. Firstly, it is essential as part of securing your project funding. The numbers would tell stakeholders or funders exactly how much money you need for the project and when the money is required. It is crucial as it explains how to utilize the project expenses. It also helps donors understand that you will adequately use the finances and deliver a sound project. The benefit is effective money management. A well-planned budget provides the basis for projects cost control. So having an appropriate budget estimate helps you to measure the project's actual cost against the approved budget and helps you see how much money you have used already. The next question is, I have heard a lot about USAID's DIV program. Can you enlighten me about this program? Like what are the benefits of DIV program for NGOs and how can we apply for the funding? Hello, dear. USAID sponsors several kinds of programs by various NGOs across the globe. The DIV program supports new ideas and build strategic plans that work best as solutions to challenges in the field of agriculture, climate, democracy, human rights, world peace, etc. As you asked about the benefits, the most important is that it provides an equal opportunity to all the NGOs across the world, irrespective of their country of origin or their area of work. 
thereby encouraging different NGOs to come forward and work towards the environmental growth of the world. Coming to its apply procedure, first you need to understand the two stages of the application process for the same. In the first stage, the NGOs that want to apply for the funding from DIV need to submit a letter of interest or LOI and make sure that the LOI being submitted is in the prescribed format only. To know more about the DIV program, you can explore our premium ebook, How NGOs Can Apply for Development Innovation Venture Program under the USAID. The link for that is available in the chat box. Moving to the next question, I have a project that focuses on the livelihoods development of poor communities in Tanzania. Can you guide me what advantages my NGO will get if I partner with USAID? Yes, why not? Funds for NGOs is the only platform that helps NGOs and development practitioners worldwide in improving their resource mobilization process and enabling a sustainable environment. Moving on to your question, you are right. Some organizations are willing to partner with NGOs to reach a common goal, and USAID is one of them. The organization partners with foundations, local organizations, cooperatives, private voluntary organizations, or PVOs are nonprofit organizations that work to address development problems abroad in international organizations. Talking about uh, the advantages, you will get financial resources for tackling development problems, the best technical expertise, greater visibility, global exposure, and widespread networking opportunities. Also, associating with USAID can bring a lot of goodwill and enhance the credibility of your NGO. To know more, you may explore our free resource on how does USAID support NGOs. The link for that is available in the chat box. Thank you for this question. The another question is, as we are talking about partnership here, can you throw a light upon how NGOs can build an effective partnership? The partnership is worth more than what each NGO can achieve on its own. Donors know this and often promote NGO partnerships for this very reason. Fortunately, we have a free article which has 12 tried and tested principles that will help all partners work in an atmosphere of trust and avoid conflict. To know more about these tips, read our article on 12 tips to build great NGO partnerships for donor funding applications. The next question is, I am a newbie in the NGO sector and I am struggling to manage my funds. When in today's time, receiving grants has become highly competitive, can I effectively manage my finances? Yes, you can. It is actually a good question because nowadays many NGOs consider financial management as a secondary activity without even considering that this may lead to the poor utilization of existing resources and financial losses. Funds for NGOs has introduced a guide for NGOs on budgetary controls for effective financial management of NGOs to understand the basics of financial management with a special focus on budgeting and budget control to help you understand the nuances of effective financial management the guide has been divided into the following two sections. 
Number one, introduction to financial management. And number two, understanding budgeting and budget control. Now we will be taking the last question of today's Q&A session. Is there anything we should keep in mind when framing a budget for the donor agency? Yes, many donor agencies while reviewing project proposals are often under the habit of comparing project proposals in highly competitive bids. This is very much prevalent. How other organizations have framed their project activities and strategies to achieve the desired goals and what type of resources they are using. It is not rare that some donors will read your proposals backwards to make sure that the proposed budget is well within reasonable expectations. If the budget is too high or even too small, the donor will not take an interest in reading the rest of the document. When you are developing a project proposal, you need to check the application guidelines to find out if a budget limit has been mentioned. If it is not mentioned, then it is an essential part of your activity to collect intelligence about it. You can call the donor agency or research past projects to find out what is the budget limit. Once you know what the budget limit is, it is a great eye-opener for you to develop the project. Well, we appreciate your significant participation in this Q&A session. If some of your questions get unanswered, please do not worry, as our team will follow up via email. If you have further questions or need any assistance or wish to share feedback, you can contact us at support at fundsforngos.org. I repeat, support at fundsforngos.org. Alternatively, you can contact us using the widget here that is also available for free users. And our customer support system will generate a ticket for you to ensure that you receive an assured response. Thank you so much for taking out time to participate in today's session. We look forward to welcoming you again with another webinar. Till then, stay healthy, stay safe.